Hey, uh, good morning and welcome to uh, today's class. We'll continue in the book of Acts. We'll start with a word of prayer and then I'll get into uh, chapter nine, where we were when we stopped last class. So maybe I'll just say a word of prayer and then we'll uh, pick up from there. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you, Lord, for this day. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives. Lord, we thank you for your leading, oh God. Father, we pray that uh, even as we take time, Lord, to meditate in the book of Acts, that, uh, Lord, you will give us the understanding that we require. And, uh, God, that uh, each one of us, Lord, will be equipped in a marvelous way, Father God, to serve your kingdom. Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for, uh, um, Lord, this great opportunity where, uh, Lord, we can focus on your word. Uh, and, uh, Lord, we pray, God, that your presence will completely take over and minister to each of our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, so Acts chapter 9, we started with um, the portion where we saw how Saul we went about threatening people and uh, he was he was moving towards Damascus to cause a lot of destruction for the people of God and on that road to Damascus uh, was that incredible encounter that he had with uh, Jesus and Jesus asks him uh, about why he was persecuting um, himself which is jesus so we saw how god feels about the persecuted and um, then we saw that uh, this was a very real encounter which uh, uh, saul had and uh, after that he was not able to see he in damascus with the believers he was there for some time there was also a believer by the name of ananias whom god used to minister to saul uh, so that saul could be healed of his blindness and uh, then go on with the work that God had called him to do. Uh, we saw how God had uh, spoken to Ananias about the destiny of Saul uh, and uh, told him not to worry because uh, Saul was someone who had a great purpose as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. And then you know, we went on to observe uh, that you know, Saul tried to launch off his ministry, but um, uh, he was not able to do that because people were uh, not receptive of who he was. We uh, saw how because of his personality or because of his background of being the persecutor to the church, even the apostles had such a difficulty in trusting that uh, Saul could be a minister of God. And so we saw that he had he made a very brief stop in Jerusalem, after which um, you know he went back to the region of uh, Cilicia, which was the um, original region of uh, Saul, and uh, he began to spend time there. So that was how this uh, entire chapter was panning out. And then towards the end of the chapter, Okay. We saw some ministry happening, and uh, this is the ministry of uh, Peter, and I kind of rushed through that. So we were at, uh, we actually went through uh, chapter 9, but then once again from chapter, from verse 32, you know, where we saw the ministry of uh, Peter in places like Lydda and um, Joppa. So in Lydda, we saw that there was a person by the name of Aeneas, and uh, this person was bedridden for eight years and was paralyzed. So, um, you know, we, we know that there were many mighty signs and wonders that were taking, through, taking place through the ministry of the apostles. Now, once again, in a place called Lydda, okay, uh, uh, this has happened. Do you know any other place where somebody who was unable to walk, uh, was able to walk earlier in a miraculous way. In the book of Acts, have we, have we seen anything earlier? Something very powerful and mighty. Chapter three. Okay. Um, okay, Jafina is saying when Peter went to the gate, beautiful. Okay, and uh, John, you said something? Uh, I was saying chapter three, the same uh, yeah. Peter and John. Yeah, Peter and John, exactly. 
So the thing for us to note is that the church, the early church, okay, and the apostles. Um, when we say the early church, we'll see later on that it was not just the leaders of the church, but even the believers. We already have an example, and that example would be Stephen, because he was just a volunteer in the church, but he was a man of faith and a man who moved in mighty signs and wonders. Now, one thing that I want us to take note of is that in the church, all these um, you know, supernatural works are so common. It was not a big deal at all. So when Peter goes for ministry, a man who's eight years paralyzed, I mean, how many uh, times do we see that in our churches today? But it's sort of common. Uh, we said earlier that the, the first eight chapters is roughly about you know a, a decade. So in the first decade, there were signs, wonders, and miracles. Now we've moved on into chapter nine, where we're talking about the next uh, decade of what is happening in the church. And uh, these things are continuing. Somebody who couldn't walk for 40 years was miraculously healed right? in chapter three. And now again, in chapter nine, through the ministry of Peter, you observe somebody who's eight years paralyzed, um, you know, being able to uh, get up and uh, function normally. So these are all things that we, we must kind of understand. The fact that, you know, God was working so powerfully um, through the early church and uh, these things were normal. So um, again, you know, we, we I've said this earlier that there's nothing really in scripture that says that God has stopped working in this way and that there was a special um, uh, sort of, you know, mandate of God only for the early church for such things to happen. There's nothing like that. So we do can expect God to uh, do these mighty signs and wonders in our lives and uh, trust God for uh, supernatural manifestations, even healings and uh, miracles. So one miracle that we are noting in the ministry of Peter is the rising up of this man, Aeneas, who was eight years bedridden. Now, I told us last time that there was one more um, ministry that Peter had to do. So just think about it. Like, you know, in their daily ministry, people would have come and asked them to come and minister in certain situations. So right now, there is a lady who's passed away, who's dead. Okay. And uh, uh, Peter has to go there and minister. So it's amazing, you know, the, the kind of faith that the early church walked in. Just some time ago, there's a paralyzed man who's getting healed. And now Dorcas, who, who has passed away, Peter goes there to minister. And he actually uh, was able to minister to her and she rose from the dead. So he calls out to her, right? Uh, in this particular situation, it's a command. He says, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Okay. So in this way, there were lots of um, wonderful and amazing things that kept taking place through the ministry of the early church. So just wanted to kind of go over this portion for us to think, um, can we expect this today? And uh, is it happening? Or uh, let's say, you know, can it happen? What are your thoughts about that? Supernatural ministry, like day to day, right? More than just preaching, teaching, there are miracles taking place. Any thoughts? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I asked too many questions at the same time. But the point that I'm making is you see a great manifestation of the supernatural in the early church. Okay. So, is that something we must expect today? If yes, why?
Okay, I yes. think we can expect the same uh -huh. because God has not changed. Okay, that's great. We can expect. All right, all right. Um, fine. So, what was that that one factor that probably helped the early church to manifest these miracles? Okay, so Jeffina is saying faith. Okay, that's great. Yeah, anyone yeah. else? Yes, Zelly. Because they, uh, they did were with Jesus and they saw Jesus. And after Jesus rose from the dead, you know, like the Holy Spirit came on them and it empowered them to do all the signs, wonders, and miracles. Yeah. So they observed the ministry of Jesus. And they learned from the ministry of Jesus. OK, great. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and Jeffina says, fellowship of the believers, kingdom mindset, which they had. OK, great. Yeah, so all these could be the reasons, faith, their uh, desire to pattern their ministry after the ministry of Jesus, their fellowship. Um, and through the fellowship, another important feature that we have seen earlier is that it was a praying church, isn't it? They were all people who got together and prayed about everything. So it was a praying church. And um, uh, another crucial thing that happened in Acts chapter 2 is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So from that point onwards, flowing in the miraculous was but normal and very common for the early church. So even today, when we walk in faith, when we um, are a prayerful body, when we uh, pattern our life and ministry according to the ministry of Jesus and the teachings of, of the word of God. And as well as, you know, uh, another thing is the baptism with the Holy Spirit, right? The empowering of the Holy Spirit. When we walk with all of these things, we'll see that today our ministry will be no different. Right? So moment to moment, we can express our faith. And that's where all these miracles and healings and things like this take place. Okay, so to, to be full of faith and to um, carry on with uh, life with faith, because we don't know, right? Like which moment, what requirement may come to us. Uh, uh, I mean, I think of myself when I read, especially this portion about Peter, where he was in Lita, then he went to Jopa. Just imagine. He may not have woken up that day thinking, okay, I'm going to meet somebody who's eight years paralyzed. Or uh, he would not have woken up thinking, I, somebody will be dead and I have to go and raise them from the dead. Okay, So it's, it's crazy. But uh, as we do our ministry day to day, we don't know the kind of needs that we may encounter. But the beautiful thing is that the early church knew how to navigate you know, through all these situations and circumstances because of the different factors that we just discussed. So it's an inspiration for us to be the way that they were. Okay, Lyndon is sharing. They waited upon the Lord and in unison evangelized piously. Uh, also, after Jesus was taken above and Holy Spirit started to guide the disciples and apostles for the first time like never before. Okay. Right. Sure. So uh, I, I think similar uh, points as we have spoken earlier. So thank you, Lyndon, for that. Now, there's another very unique thing that is mentioned in this passage. We find that uh, uh, Peter, he stays, the last uh, verse there, verse 43, he stays in Joppa with Simon a Tanner. Now, Simon a Tanner, that is a little bit of um, a shocker because 
when we think about peter he was a very devout jew and uh, uh, you know as, as far as peter was concerned he did not want to associate with non jews uh, neither did he want to associate with people who were considered um, uh, somehow uh, you know lower by the jews but after the baptism in the holy spirit after the ascension of jesus there were many changes that were taking place in the heart of peter god was really working in his heart and in his life opening him up to the possibility of ministering to all kinds of people not necessarily the people who are from his own community okay, the jewish community so when we read here in verse 43 that uh peter stays with simon a tanner we all know who a tanner is tanner working with you know uh, the uh, skin of animals dead animals so the jews those days were not um, they they looked down upon tanners and they would not associate with tanners but as the believing community grew we find that peter is not feeling bad about associating with somebody like a tanner he is even living in the house of a tanner right and the scripture also says he stayed many days in joppa with simon so uh it's showing us that peter who is known for his uh jewish you know his his uh, uh pride in the jewish traditions and culture he is also opening himself up to ministering to any kind of a person so you see so far what we've seen till acts chapter 9 is that uh, the gospel right and the ministry of the early church uh, it is more focused towards the jews do you remember even when jesus ministered as part of the covenant he ministered to the jews but there's something dramatic that is going to happen from acts chapter 10 remember that a uh, very key scripture uh, that we all talk about john 3:16 what does it say god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son isn't it so god so loved the world so far the promises the blessings the covenant all of that is for the jews but from acts chapter 10 god will do something historical as far as the the uh, you know the church is concerned and what is that uh, we will see that the gospel will now be taken to the gentiles by the church and who is god going to use to do this he's going to work through peter the same person or the same individual who's not very open uh, to ministering outside of his own jewish community so that is incredible you know that god would use a person who was earlier unwilling to do a work for the kingdom uh, and uh, so you know the uh, work of god in people's hearts is so evident let's move now to acts chapter 10 here we'll start from uh, verse 1 and uh, we could okay we could read till verse 6 to begin with if someone can uh, please unmute and read that would be very help- helpful acts 10 One to six. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him. he was afraid and said what is it lord 
So he said to him, Your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon at Anna, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. Okay. So in this case, we see that Cornelius receives a message from God. Who is this man Cornelius? He's a centurion uh, of what was called the Italian regiment. So he's a man of uh, influence and a man of authority, a centurion who commands a you know, uh, hundred soldiers under him. But what is the speciality uh, as far as his um, character or his uh, devotion towards God is concerned. The Bible also teaches us that he was a devout man, a man who feared God and gave arms. He prayed always and he also gave arms generously. So notice this. There is a man who is um, devoted to God and he's trying to follow God uh, by, by serving him. And God has taken notice of this particular person. And God wants him to know about what Jesus has done so that he too can um, walk in salvation. So then what happens? At the ninth hour, we are told, he saw clearly the vision, an angel of God coming in. So in the book of Acts, there are very many um, communications of God and in various ways. We've seen earlier, you know, you, you saw an angel just showing up uh, when uh, for the when Peter and John, right? Like uh, the initial time when uh, they were caught. At that time also, you have a message through an angel coming through to them. Uh, we are now seeing that in a vision, there is an angel of God coming and bringing a message to the people. So in various ways, uh, people are hearing from God. And in Acts chapter 8, we saw how Philip was receiving the prophetic word. We saw pieces of the message of God. Uh, he first heard like a small, uh, he heard a phrase, and then he heard a sentence. He followed through with it, and then he was able to minister to the Ethiopian eunuch. He was able to uh, move on in his journey. So God has communicated in various ways. Now, in this particular chapter, God is communicating to a devout man called as Cornelius, and God is speaking through an angel in a vision. Okay, So these are all ways in which God speaks to us, and we must be open to that. So what did he tell him? Uh, he told him, your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. Now notice that also. That's also really beautiful. Prayers and arms. Sometimes we um, we feel like you know our prayers or our giving has not really broken through before God. But think about this: God is taking notice of everything. A devout man, Cornelius, he does not even know the gospel, right? He does not even understand the gospel, but he's just trying to be uh, uh, devoted towards God and follow the right right uh, actions. But God is taking notice of that. God is saying, look, Cornelius, whatever you have done, your prayers, your giving, isn't that so comforting that even our prayers, our giving, it's not, um, it doesn't go waste. God notices. And God had taken notice of such a man known as Cornelius. Even earlier, we saw about Dorcas, her good life, and you know she was a good woman. God had taken notice of the way people were actually living their lives. And notice how each one is from a different uh, community. Each one is from a different class and section. Now we are looking at uh, somebody like Cornelius, who is a pretty, you know, a, a person of authority in the Italian regiment. So no matter who they are, God is taking notice of uh, their acts of devotion. And then it says that it has come up for a memorial before God, meaning God has remembered you. God has remembered you. And uh, an instruction is given to Cornelius that you need to send some men 
uh, to Jopa and uh, exactly where. Remember, we talked about the word of knowledge. Even when Ananias got told him, you need to go and minister to Saul, uh, how, how did God tell him, go to this road, uh, street called straight? So that's the word of knowledge where uh, facts or information in the natural is provided to us. So even here, the address is given. What is the address? Cornelius, you send some men. Where to send them? Send them to Jopa. And over there, there will be somebody known as a Simon, whose surname is Peter, in case obviously they're going to find a man who they don't know. So they need to know. God is giving the full name. Don't go and catch some other Simon. Go and uh, uh, go and meet Simon Peter. And where is the Simon Peter? In that city of Jopa. He is lodging in Simon the Tanner's house. So notice very, very clear instruction. Same thing today. Is God able to even tell us somebody's address if we have to go and minister to them? Why not? It happened in the book of Acts, right? So it can happen even today. These are all, these are all um, examples that should really build expectation in our hearts. You know, we are seeing people who were sick for so long healed. We are seeing the dead raised. We are seeing people receiving information, communication from God. That's even so specific. You know, the address is being provided. So uh, God is instructing. God is orchestrating. So while we look at the book of Acts as uh, the acts of the apostles, it's really the acts of God through his people. It's really the acts of the Holy Spirit through his people. You know, doesn't it look like God is directing everything? Uh, it's, it's almost like, you know, one seed is playing out here and another seed is playing out there. But it's only because people were willing to listen to God and do what God was telling them to do. So uh, now God has given an instruction to whom? To Cornelius. Now, the other very crucial thing about Cornelius is He's a Gentile, apart from his uh, position, uh, personality, devotion, community. Which community does he belong to? He's a Gentile. So far, we've not seen the gospel being intentionally taken out. And nobody is planning that among the apostles. But who is planning that? God is planning that. Because remember, Acts chapter 1, uh, 1 verse 8, what did it say? It said that you shall be my witnesses, right? The, the final portion of that in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the gospel has to go out to everyone. And it has started in the book of Acts. So in that second decade, the gospel is moving out of the community of the Jews. So Cornelius, Cornelius is that first Gentile whom the gospel will be preached to by one of the apostles. So now let's move on. We will read from verse 7, and uh, we can continue till verse 16. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout sh uh, a shoulder from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. When he, he came, when he became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they met ready, he fell into a trance. And so having a pen and an object like a great sheet bond at the four corners descending to him and led down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, No, so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. Uh, 
okay at this point there is the communication uh, so i told us that god is orchestrating so it's like a very good planner first god speaks to cornelius how does he speak to him he uses a certain uh, uh, method in a vision through an angel he speaks to him now we see that peter uh, another crucial person uh, in in the, this particular happening needs to know what has to be done so what's happening now now we find that uh, cornelius has has followed through on what god told him but peter is having a vision so in simon the tatter's house on the house top he went up to pray uh, about the sixth hour so remember i told us that peter is a very devout jew who's proud about his traditions so he followed the prayer times just like the jews he kept those traditions uh, and at the time at the sixth hour that's uh, you know around around the time that the meal would be served it says that he became very very hungry okay and uh, he fell into a trance so think about this sometimes the very situation that we are going through god can uh, use that situation as well to speak to us isn't that wonderful uh, it, it's not only like you know so disconnected from our situation but right now peter is hungry and that in uh, that instance god is using to communicate something to him but what is the method through which the message comes to peter this time it's a trance what is a trance uh, anyone what is a trance vision okay we all know vision what that could be what is a trance no idea uh, anyone here would you know what a trance is Google this. Huh? This is on Google. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the advantage of being an online student. You can Google anything and everything. Okay. So John Paul is saying a vision completely in an unconscious state. Yes, that would be that would be the description. So a trance is when. Uh, both in your mind and in your body right you you just feel weak for a moment uh where you're no longer functional suddenly you kind of uh, encountered the spiritual realm and it's almost like as uh, john paul is saying uh, unconscious state okay but you're very much alive as far as the spiritual uh communication is concerned so though physically you may have fallen down or uh, even there are trances where people don't necessarily fall down but uh, where i've heard testimonies of people who became like statues for many hours okay and this uh, you can read up the story from the life of maria woodworth etta and uh, she had these experiences when she used to go and minister in meetings apparently she would just freeze for many hours and nobody will know like what's happening why are people frozen but it's a trance they've just they've just um become like you know unconscious sort of and uh, spiritual in the spiritual god may be imparting many things into their spirit god may be speaking many things uh, they may be receiving messages from god so similarly when peter is very very hungry uh, that day uh, he goes into a trance i always imagine it as maybe he just uh, lay down and he was uh, very weak so he he was lying down and uh, unconscious and at that time in a vision he saw uh, that there was a sheet that came down and you you had the all the animals you know that were shown which actually according to the law which was given earlier those were 
forbidden for the Jews to eat. But in this particular vision, God is saying, Peter, rise up, uh, kill and eat. Okay, And Peter, being a faithful Jew, says, no, God, I will not touch uh, these animals. But God says, uh, you know, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Okay, so uh, basically what God is saying is, uh, there's this whole thing about kosher and uh, um, uh, non-kosher animals in the Jewish law. Don't even classify. Everything is blessed by God. Everything is cleansed by God. You know, that kind of a message comes to him. Now, what do we understand uh, from this particular vision? We'll see you know, how this vision is actually processed. So maybe we should read a little bit more and then we will have an idea. So we've read till verse 16. Now let's keep reading on. Um, it's quite long, the passage, but uh, let's, let's read till verse 23, 17 to 23. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, Behold, the men who had been sent from the Cornelius had uh, made inquiry of Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Sorry. Uh, Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he who you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the Jews, nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house, to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. Uh, on the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Yes, thank you, John. So we see what's happening. Now, Peter has a vision, okay? It's a little disturbing for him because it's like God is saying, the word that I gave you earlier in the, uh, like, you know, in the law, uh, don't go by that. All these animals are clean. So he's wondering. What could this vision mean? So he does not even have the interpretation of the vision. He's in that state. But while he's still thinking about the vision, what happens? Those three men, remember, Cornelius had uh, sent them. Those people come to Simon Simon's house. And uh, God is speaking another word to him. Now, he has not yet understood the vision in, in the trance. Before that, one more communication where God is telling him, three, three men are seeking you, arise therefore, go down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So God is clearing his doubts, okay? But he still is not clear as to what God is doing. So thank God for, you know, somebody like Peter who was sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. At least he knows what he has to do next. So then... Uh, uh, you know, Peter confirms, yes, I am the person uh, that you're all seeking. He tells those three men who came and uh, they introduce themselves. They say, look, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, uh, one who fears God, you know, man with a good reputation. He's the one who has uh, told us to come here uh, and, uh, you know, to take you. So Peter went with them and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So Peter's itinerary, right? Like God is just making the ministry happen. So there are different, different opportunities coming his way. But how is he going about his ministry following the voice of the Lord? Okay. Is he clear about all things by now? Not necessarily. He's still wondering what could that vision mean by God is saying you can eat all animals, even those forbidden animals. He's wondering about that. And yet the next instruction he follows, which is actually to go to the house of Cornelius. Now, let's read on. Uh, now, Peter is going to meet this centurion by the name of Cornelius. So you'll see that in this passage, 
uh, uh, there there will be a lot of repetition of uh, what that dream was, what God spoke to Cornelius, what God spoke to Peter, so on and so forth. But you know, just bear with me as we uh, sort of go through the entire chapter. So let's uh, quickly read now from verse 24 to verse 33. Okay, um, yeah, Acts chapter 10, verse 24. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. And he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go uh, to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked them, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting under this hour, and at ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in the bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your arms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon at Tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to me. Now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Okay, wonderful. So uh, you see, now uh, Peter left from Simon the Tanner's house and he has come to Cornelius's house in Caesarea. And remember, we said that Peter didn't understand the meaning of the vision. But when he finally came to Cornelius's house, what is Peter doing? He's explaining the vision, right? So it happens to us also. Sometimes we see a vision, we have a dream, we don't know what it means. We just have to keep praying and uh, trusting the Holy Spirit to give us the interpretation of that vision. So thankfully, in some time, Peter got the interpretation. He understood. What was God saying? See how clearly he's explaining what that vision was. Verse 28, he says, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to uh, one of another nation. So he clearly understood. Basically, what that vision meant was it was not just about animals, right? It was about meeting people of another nation or another community as a Jewish person. But what God has shown him, he says, God has shown me that I should not call any man un uh, common or unclean. So that is the point which Peter has understood, okay? And he's now open to ministering to Cornelius. And Cornelius now repeats uh, his story of, I saw a man in bright clothing, meaning an angel came and he told me that somebody will come and he will uh, tell you something. So we are just waiting here to listen to the message, uh, Peter, that you are going to bring to us. So now what is going to happen in the house of uh, Cornelius? Uh, let's see. This is also like really encouraging to see the response of the family. So we can, uh, maybe I will read uh, from verse 34 to verse 43. It says that Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Now God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things 
which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to the witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So you see how uh, Peter actually preaches Christ. So he's preaching from all the incidents that took place in the Judean region that people knew about Jesus and the miracles that Jesus did and all that. But you see, what is the point of the preaching? It's always to proclaim Jesus as Christ. And that's what Peter is doing towards the end. He's letting Cornelius know that this Jesus, he says, to be a uh, judge of living and the dead. Who, who can uh, that be? It can only be God. So he's saying Jesus is God. Jesus is deity. And, uh, you know, it is through the work of Jesus that sins are forgiven. Now, the message is being preached, okay, as per the format of the, uh, the service. But something very wonderful happens. I'll quickly read the next couple of uh, verses here and then we can go for a break. So while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, okay, anyway, we don't have time to read the other verses. I'll, I'll do that later. But one point that I want to make, very, very important point. You see how beautiful it is. The gospel is now being preached to the Gentiles. They just heard the message about Jesus just like moments ago. And what does the Bible say? Verse 40, 44 is very special because it says, while Peter was still speaking, his sermon is not over. But what did God do? Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. So they are already being baptized in the Holy Spirit before the sermon got over. Is that possible in our churches? Yes, why not? Generally, we find that when we lay hands on people, they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But in the case of Cornelius and his household, the Holy Spirit fell even before Peter stopped his message. So uh, it shows how God was eager to touch the nations, okay, to touch uh, communities, even the Gentiles, right? Uh, and uh, to really see the spread of the gospel across. So let's go for a break now. We'll just come back and we will see the other different things that happen in Acts 10, the last portion, as well as Acts 11. Thank you. See you in 10 minutes.